All right, folks. Hello, welcome to the What's New session for OpenShift 4.8. Got the whole product management team with me, and so we're excited to talk to you about what is in this release. Uh, as a reminder, we're going to cover all of OpenShift Platform Plus today. So we're going to talk about um, all the goodness that we have in OpenShift, our platform services, updates to Kubernetes, as well as advanced cluster management, advanced cluster security, and Red Hat Quay. We've got some themes for OpenShift 4.8. Um, we did a bunch of work on installer flexibility. So uh, we know a lot of folks in their IT environments sometimes have uh, protected roles for uh, making new IAM on Amazon. Uh, want to use STS tokens, uh, install into different resource groups that already exist. So we've done a ton of work there on Amazon and Azure, um, as well as pick up Kubernetes 1.21. Some exciting feature graduation. Um, we uh, have a bunch of uh, APIs that are going to their stable V1s in Kubernetes, as well as some features in OpenShift that are going GA. Um, we've got um, our cron jobs, pod disruption budgets, and vertical pod autoscalers as well as scheduling profiles going to Tech Preview. And what we're really excited about is IPv6, single, and dual stack. And then our next-gen developer tools, um, we've got a bunch of investment in OpenShift GitOps, which we were excited to GA, as well as OpenShift Pipelines. And then lastly, a new Tech Preview coming in the uh, developer tools arena is serverless functions. So we've already GA'd some of our other serverless technologies. This is kind of getting closer to a functions as a service experience. I'm really excited to talk about that more uh, later on in the presentation. All right, and then I want to dig into Kubernetes 121. This is what we're shipping with Kubernetes, or excuse me, with OpenShift 4.8. Um, as I mentioned, a bunch of APIs have graduated to stable, um, as well as some better uh, control over node disruption. This is a big uh, thing for us because we do our um, upgrades over the air, and so we care about how your pods are moved off of nodes and moved back on. So uh, a new node shutdown timer um, gives you a little bit more control over that, as well as pod disruption budgets really are that main uh, kind of primitive that you have, uh, and that's going to graduate to stable as well. Um, Kube 121 is required for IPv4 and IPv6 dual stack support, um, so we've been waiting on that one to call that GA. Uh, and then a few other pod scheduling primitives are coming in Kube 121. Um, so in alpha, there's the memory manager, and then in beta is uh, storage capacity. And as always, a reminder that we version Kubernetes with OpenShift. So we've got Cryo 121, we've got Kube 121, and we've got OpenShift 4.8, all designed, tested to work together. And then here is the, the overall OpenShift roadmap. Um, so uh, this is kind of as far out as we can see. Um, I'll let you pause your video if you want. We're not going to dig into all these things, but you can see that we've got a ton of investment happening in the developer tool space our application space, as well as the platform itself, and then our hosted and managed clusters. Um, so take a look, um, and we'd love to talk to you more one-on-one -on -one if you've got uh, certain questions about anything. And over to Mike. All right. Uh, thanks, Rob. So this is probably the only slide that doesn't have anything to do with OpenShift 4.8, uh, but since it's June and we are having a, a life cycle event, we thought we'd draw your attention to it. So the last release of OpenShift 3 was OpenShift 3.11, and this month in June, it leaves its end of full support. We're extremely proud of the 3.x uh, line. It's been nothing but successful with our customers and users and the ecosystem, but it is time to move it on to its next stage, and that is maintenance support. So maintenance support is critical CVEs and critical bugs, and that will go all the way to June of 2022. Now the next one is a little confusing to some people, but easy to understand once you know what the words mean. It's extended life cycle phase, and that simply means that we're still answering the phone, but we're not issuing any fixes. So after 2022 going into 2024, and by the way, 2024 is like the next presidential election here in the United States, so pretty far out there. Uh, we're just answering the phone and we're pointing you to existing patches that have already been pushed out. We're not doing any code changes uh, in between those years. Now, we did announce this month an awesome new offering, and that is at the top of the public lifecycle page. It looks like that blue box. And it says that if you are in a current OpenShift 3 to OpenShift 4 migration, and then you want a little bit more time on that maintenance cycle, maybe you just want one more year, right? So June 2022 
to June 2023, we do have a for sale offering that would allow you to buy CVE and critical fixes during that one year extension. Um, and that is uh, also mentioned on the migration page. So definitely spend some time on our uh, migration page. If you haven't visited in a while, there's a lot of tools and, and really great content on that migration page. And with that, we'll move back to 4.8 and to the spotlights. And I believe um, a CMAC is kicking us off. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so OpenShift pipelines, that's downstream uh, add-on on OpenShift that productizes Tecton upstream project, the Kubernetes native CI CD system for Kubernetes, built for Kubernetes. And on OCB 4.8, 1.5 OpenShift pipelines, 1.5 will be released. We are already G8 on OCB 4.7, and now the next release of that will be made available. There are a bunch of really significant um, requests we have had from customers that are included in this release. The first one of those are uh, auto pruning of pipeline runs and task runs, uh, so that this has been possible before, but customers had to manually create a cron job. Now the operator manages that, and they can configure to keep the latest uh, 20 of their Python runs, for example, and automatically get the rest of them get garbage collected, not to burden its CD. The, the other big chunk of capability that are coming in, in 1.5 is pipeline as code. It enables Git-centric workflows around your pipeline themselves, not just about your application, but the pipeline definition itself. So you define your pipeline, your take-down pipeline uh, in, as YAML, put in your Git repo, and uh, that's all that there is to it. Uh, you don't create on the, anything on the cluster. If every time there's a change on the repo, that definition is taken and exec gets executed on the cluster. And there are a bunch of features around that, like event filtering. You can define if that needs to happen on uh, comments or pull requests or other events, for example, which branches, which tags that should be included or should be monitored for, for those changes. There is automatic task resolution, so you don't have to have the take on tasks that your pipeline needs on the cluster, and rather you can keep them in your repo alongside your pipeline, or simply just refer to them in another repo, or if you just name them, the platform automatically install them from Tecton Hub. Uh, there is also a, a, a file support in, in Pipeline as Code that allows you to limit who can uh, trigger your CI uh, on OpenShift pipelines uh, to, to avoid uh, bad actors. You don't want just anyone to create a PR and turn three your CI, so you can have a limited number of users or groups roles that, that are able to do that. And we, we support pull request commands. And one of those is actually for the previous point. So if you have defined particular users that are approved to, to run the CI, then those when the PR comes, then those people can go and run and, and, and put a comment on that PR, okay to test, and the CI gets triggered. Or it can run a retest, for example. Uh, similar flows uh, to, to Prow if you're familiar in, in the community's board with that. There is integration with GitHub Checks API. So on your PR, you would get the result of your pipeline execution as it executes on OpenShift, but the results are available on your PR as well with the details to the task and link to the logs of all those task runs back to the, on the platform in OpenShift console. And currently in the first release of that, uh, we support GitHub and GitHub Enterprise. Uh, it's a dev preview feature, and over the next feature, the next releases, we're gonna add GitLab and Bitbucket as well. Uh, the next item is the ability to customize the default uh, templates that we ship with OpenShift pipelines. You might have noticed when you're adding an application through Dev Console, you have a checkbox to add a, t add a pipeline as well, and customers can replace these templates that we give them with their own sophisticated pipeline that they can provide to their dev team. And around uh, Dev Console, uh, Dev Console team has done an amazing job, really, with uh, a lot of enhancements uh, around usability of pipeline and Dev Console. There, there are much more than what I can list here. So you would notice a lot of improvements around the, the, the specific the UX of pipelines inside Dev Console. Next slide, please. Uh, the next piece of work we've done is OpenShift GitOps. Again, G8 on OC. 7, OC 4.8, 1.2 of OpenShift GitOps will be released. Uh, another uh, frequently requested capability that we have had is that Argo CD authentication should be integrated with OpenShift so that OpenShift users can reuse their credentials to log in into OpenShift. And in previous version, versions, we had a manual process to set that up. Uh, in 1.2, the operator sets that up automatically through uh, provision and RHSSO. 
uh, as a part of Argo CD, is embedded inside uh, the Argo CD, uh, the namespace that runs Argo CD. We have also simplified the privilege configuration of Argo CD. A lot of our customers want to give an instance of Argo CD to their development team and limit that Argo CD instance to only the namespaces that the dev teams have access to so they can apply, they can follow GitOps processes only for that dev development team application within the namespaces they have access to. And in, in doing so, they have to create a number of role bindings and role. It's, uh, it's fairly uh, cumbersome and not complex, but it's a lot of toil that needs to be created. In 1.2, we have automated that, and it, all of that goes inside the Argo CD CR, and the operator takes care of that. You just specify which namespaces Argo CD needs to have access to, and the operator configures those, like, create those role bindings needed so that Argo CD cannot break out of the, the boundaries that is defined for it. Um, the environments view that some of you might have noticed in Dev Console uh, is, is um, there are enhancements around the UX of that. When you use the GitOps um, Application Manager CLI, CAM, for uh, bootstrapping your GitOps process, you get your application listed there. You can get to the environments view. And we have more, uh, more work uh, planned on the following releases in that area as well. And last but not least, we have done a lot of collaboration uh, with the uh, ACM team. They have done a great job on bringing Argo CD more into the experience of ACM. So when you are managing a cluster within ACM, ACM recognizes that there is Argo CD on those clusters and it would import the cluster registry of ACM into Argo CD's registry so that it can easily define applications Argo CD and sync Git repos to those clusters as well. Uh, and within ACM console or dashboard, you, can, you, you would notice Argo CD instances of applications. So Argo CD applications recognize both in the topology and the list of applications with a role of capability. So if you have Argo, the same application across, across multiple clusters, ACM can um, roll that up to a single application that can expand to all those clusters if you, uh, if you need to. And with that, I'll pass it on to Adel, I think. Yeah, thank you, Siam. So um, in 4.8, we're also introducing OpenShift Sandbox Containers as Tech Preview. Um, OpenShift Sandbox Containers brings along um, as the, under, like the overlay for Kata Containers. So what is Kata Containers? Kata Containers is an upstream project um, that provides you with an OCI compliant runtime um, to run your workloads in virtual machines, in lightweight virtual machines, was the same exact experience um, as you would do with normal containers. Um, what we bring with OpenShift Sandbox containers is an operator, and the operator takes care of doing all the grunt works, um, combining all the bits and pieces to bring Kata containers to your OpenShift cluster. Um, including, so some of the tasks that the operator does, um, it, it, it is available on the Red Hat operator catalog on the console, so you can enable it as any other operator with OpenShift. Um, it exposes a CRD for you as a cluster admin, for example, to configure uh, day one and day two tasks. Um, and it provides um, Chemo as the back end for, or as your virtual machine monitor uh, using CoreOS extensions. Additionally, it provides the Kata containers RPMs and installs them in, in the node, the same method with OS extensions. This allow us to um, delegate the lifecycle management uh, to a tool that does it very well, uh, the machine config operator. And then you have, it does also um, cryo configuration. So you would need to configure usually script that um, uh, without an operator <clears throat> to configure the handler, add the runtime handler for any runtime class you're adding to your cluster. In that case, we're adding a Kata containers as an additional runtime class, um, which also the operator will create that runtime resource for you. So it basically automates all these necessary steps that you'd usually do via bash scripts and does the life cycling. How you would use that, um, basically as a cluster admin, you'd create our uh, resource called Kata config. And that resource, at the, like at the moment, allows you to choose which nodes you're, you're um, enabling Kata containers on. So you have the choice to choose um, or um, to, to um, configure certain nodes and not all of the nodes of your cluster um, to run Kata specific workloads or virtual uh, machine workloads. And um, it also, so once you create that Kata config resource, the operator will create a runtime class for you. And that runtime class um, has also a scheduler um, and a handler um, that allows you to then, as a developer, 
um, or a cluster admin, create a pod which references that runtime class. And eventually when you do that, so the, the only thing you basically need to do on your pod level is just set the runtime class name to Kata. And what this does is basically run your workload in a lightweight virtual machine uh, using an OCI compliant runtime, just Kata containers. Now, what are the default use cases? Was what we have now, or was the addition of OpenShift sandbox containers? You would usually, in, in, in most of the cases, you would run normal containers, um, and that basically fits most of the needs. Um, when you're rehosting or you have existing VM workloads um, that exist outside of uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift, and you would like to bring them to, um, to be cube native, and they have no existing image, so you have not built an image or a container image for that, then OpenShift virtualization could be um, a good default use case uh, or a good product to use. Um, on the other hand, if you have built an image already and you, you're already uh, far in your cloud native journey, then uh, OpenShift sandbox containers can be a good choice for you um, to re-architect and uh, because it's also an OCI compliant runtime, so the experience is exactly the same. You're just changing the runtime class. Um, when is it useful? It's useful for kernel isolation or for third party apps um, that you have no control over. But for most cases, normal containers uh, should should also be fine for you use cases. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, over to you, Naina. Thank you, Adele. So OpenShift Serverless brings the serverless deploy platform to OpenShift that enables the users to run almost any containerized workload in serverless fashion, aka scale up on demand and scale back to zero. What serverless functions bring is a simple, focused, and opinionated way to author solutions and then deploy them in serverless manner. It is a collection of tools that enable developers to create and run functions as a K-native service on Kubernetes, and we are delighted to announce the serverless functions tech preview with OpenShift 4.8. Uh, functions is offering a simple programming model um, that reduces the complexity, and it empowers users to no longer worry about platform specifics like networking, resource com consumption, sizing, etc. And functions take it a step further and takes the application configuration, project structure, and container creation as well. You create and deploy your application in two commands. Uh, Dev Console has a new visualization for these functions, and they play very well with the drag and drop topology of event sources. And this will be covered later in the presentation by Serena in Dev Console section. The simplicity of function is what attracts the power developers and non-developers, such as data scientists, so they can easily author their models and web servers, even to listen on the port for the services. And apart from shielding the developers from platform specifics, it also provides a certain level of consistency and safety security. Functions offer well-loved runtime languages such as Quarkus, Node, Python, Go, Spring Boot, with TypeScript and Rust on the horizon. And with the vast event sources, courtesy of KMLK, and the addition of Kafka event source as GA, serverless is paving the way for production-grade event-driven solutions to solve your today's modern-day challenges. Um, with that, over to you, Mark. Thank you. So uh, this one, IPv6 single dual stack support. So this is a feature that represents a huge body of work between that and the upstream community. Also something that many of our customers have been waiting for for quite a while. But this has finally landed in OpenShift 4.8 with the GA of Kubernetes 121. Um, so we are providing full support for IPv6 when you're using OVN as the cluster networking. So IPv6 comes in two forms, single stack, where you choose one of IPv4 or v6. And then all OpenShift networking is going to be 100% aligned to that choice. Or you can choose dual stack, where your pods are going to get both a v4 and a v6 address. And then the cluster can communicate with any internal or external endpoints that are using v4 or v6. So this, this latter configuration, dual stack, represents the vast majority of our customer use cases, uh, but we support both. Um, and the reason why it really represents the vast majority is because there always seems to be that one server somewhere in your ecosystem that is still v4 only uh, that you'll need to work with, even though you've, you've progressed on to v6. So IPv6 support is for bare metal deployments currently, but we'll add other platforms that are um, 
IPv6 capable in the future. Next slide and Gaurav, please. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Gaurav Singh. Uh, there are a few features that we have graduated from. Uh, sorry. There are a few features that we have graduated from uh, Tech Preview to GA. Uh, first one is Vertical Pod Autoscaler, or also known as VPA. What it is is you are adding, uh, it's scaling up of your pod by adding more resources um, into the pod. Let's take an example. Let's say your uh, application team, team build an application, give it to you to run it in, in the production. You don't know how to size it. You can use VPA and run some simulation load on there. And based on historic CPU and memory, you can figure out what resources it will need and run it in production. Uh, another uh, feature is cron job is basically what you have in cron tab in Linux uh, uh, where you can schedule your jobs to be run at particular time in a day. Uh, let's take an example. Let's say you have your master nodes being deployed in each zone and your worker being deployed in west zone. And when you create your cron job, it, it is going to schedule your job based on the zone where your master load node lives. In this case, it'll be a east zone. Uh, part disruption budget, uh, basically avoid application outage by using part disruption budget, right? For, let's take an example. Let's say you have three copy of your application. Your business requirement is that one copy of the application should be running all the time then you can define that in the part disruption budget. And then let's say you click uh, upgrade that will drain the node. It will start evicting part one and then part two. When, it's, when it goes to part three, it, it reaches the eviction, uh, that budget and will pass the eviction uh, process. So making sure you have one copy of the application running all the time. Next slide, please. Uh, well, so let's little, talk a little bit about VPA. Uh, so uh, in VPA, um, whenever uh, you accept a recommendation uh, from VPA to add more resources, it's going to evict the pod uh, and then reschedule. So uh, um, in order to you know define a design a fail safe method, uh, we had. Uh, uh, we have put in definition that at, at the minimum, VPA can only be ap applicable to a deployment set which has two pods. And you can always change it manually by going into configuration. There are a few modes uh, that VPA runs. And two modes, which is very popular, is off mode, which is your recommender mode, where uh, it will just recommend you how much CPU and memory based on historical data is needed for the pod. Uh, second is recreate is fully automatic. It's gonna recommend and apply the changes without your intervention. So next presenter, please. Hey everyone, all I'm over here. So um, we have many customers tell us their IT departments don't allow them to use wildcard certs in, in production. So now 4.8, we allow users to configure the external console auth service and CLI download routes hosted on the cluster. The configuration is done on the cluster ingress resource object under the cluster administration. Um, Add-ins can now set the URLs and certs in one spot. And if no cert is uh, presented, uh, it should use the default certs from the ingress controller. In the future, uh, other external routes will be configurable from here as well. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this slide is all about making things easy, right? So on the left-hand side, we, we added the ability to import multiple uh, uh, multiple doc YAML. So you can go ahead to the import YAML screen, drag a bunch of a uh, bunch of YAML files over, and go ahead and import them in very easily. And then on the right-hand side, we added the ability ability to drag and drop uh, jar files right into the topology view. So you can pick your favorite Spring or Quarkus application, bring it over. Um, you'll see then it'll get up, the upload will get initiated and then build. The logs will be presented, and voila, your application is then uh, available uh, for you to use in OpenShift. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to hand it off to Serena. Great. Thanks, Ali. 
Um, so to continue to focus on the developer experience in the OpenShift console, we're going to talk about uh, the enhancements that were made to the console for serverless. In 4.8, we've made progress in three main areas. Um, the first one is, and this is what the um, the image is about here on the on the screen. It's around the make serverless tech preview action, which actually creates a new serverless deployment next to your existing deployments. Other configurations, including the traffic pattern, et cetera, can still be modified in the in the form. Um, so this is really exciting on how to uh, convert an existing workload to serverless and um, we'll continue to en enhance those features as we uh, produce additional releases. The second one is around topology. We now support visualizing cloud functions. And additionally, as Nana mentioned, we do support uh, all the associated commands as well as the ease of use of drag and drop capabilities when interacting with those cloud functions. And uh, the third item is that we now have advanced scaling options for Knative services. So concurrency utilization, which allows users to set the percentage of concurrent requests before scaling up is now available. And then we also have support for auto scale window, which allows users to set the duration to look back um, for marketing, for marking auto scaling decisions. And the service is scaled to zero if no requests are received in that time period. On the next slide, we talk about what we've been doing for to continue to improve onboarding. So we now have a getting started resources card for both cluster admins and um, and developers. So on the left hand side, you'll see the top image is what we're doing for cluster admins on the cluster overview page. It provides resources to help set up your clusters, building with guided documentation, which is our quick starts, as well as exploring new admin features. And then that similar card is available for de developers on the ad page, which is the bottom left corner. And that provides resources to creating applications using samples uh, powered by dev files, the ability to build guided documentation, so quick starts for developers, and also ability to explore new developer features. And one of the things there is that's pointing out to like the latest what's new blog. Um, and then additionally, we also have some great, a, a great enhancement to quick start. So as you, you all kind of know, in 4.7, we've provided a mechanism for custom quick starts. And in 4.8, we've addition, added this additional feature. So quick starts uh, authors can now use special syntax in their console quick start. They can use the copy um, name to provide a way for users to copy a string into their copy buffer. But even more kind of exciting is the ability that you can use execute commands so that if you have the web terminal operator installed, there's a way for the users just to see the command in the quick start, click uh, an icon, and it actually executes in the web terminal for you. On the next slide, we're going to talk about um, two additional ways to customize the developer experience. Both of these features have been really requested heavily by customers. So the first one is around the ability to customize which roles are being shown in the project access area in, in the developer console. So again, the screen on the left-hand side is showing that. This is a way for developers to quickly provide access to their project. Um, and so this new feature allows uh, admins to not only to enhance the number of roles that are available in that dropdown. There's some syntax that's shown there uh, on how to achieve that. Um, and in addition to that, we also have uh, the project that access customization is in the console spec, and that code snippet is available in the YAML editor for this customization. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that we now provide access for cluster admins to hide features from the ad page, another thing that people have asked for in the, in the past. So this feature allows um, just allows the admin the ability to hide whatever things that they don't want the developers to access. And to achieve this, again, Similarly, it's a customization in the console spec for ad page, and there's a code snippet that's available in the, the YAML editor for this as well. Um, and this snippet here shown on the screen is just showing how do you hide the import from dev file entry, for example. Okay, and then finally, uh, we've recently, on the next slide, we've recently announced the certification program for Helm charts and have been working with a few partners to get them in the catalog. So our catalog now, um, display the developer catalog now displays a uh, a badge there if for the charts that are certified the certified charts are also going to be visible in the red hat marketplace and additional charts will be made available to the catalog but if you're interested in some specific charts from partners you can engage with the partner team and now i'm going to hand it over to marcus to talk about installer flexibility
Thank you. So as you might know already, for OpenSea 4, there are two primary installation experience. Uh, the first one is uh, full, ext full stack automation, or IPI, where the installer controls all the areas of the installation, including infrastructure provisioning with an opinionated best practices deployment for OpenShift. And the second one is uh, pre-existing infrastructure deployments, or UBI, where administrators are responsible for creating and, and managing the, their own infrastructure, allowing them greater customization and, and operational flexibility. For this release, for 4.8, the support provider list stays the same as uh, 4.7. Next slide, please. With uh, this announcement, users can now deploy OpenShift into an empty user create Azure resource group. By providing your own resource group for customers who are more security, security consensus, the, the, this allows the Azure, Azure service principal to be a scope only the, the resource group, VNet, and a public DNS zone rather than the whole subscription. To enable this uh, this feature, we use the platform Azure resource group name field in the in the install config file during the installation. Note that uh, when destroying the cluster, the user defined resource group is also being deleted. Next slide, please. Use a pre-existing root 53 host private zones uh, with shared VPCs. Um, so support has been asked to specify an existing root 53 private uh, hosted, so hosted zone, sorry, in, in cases where OpenSIF is deployed in a shared VPC. In situations where the VPC is owned by a different account that the account is used uh, to deploy OpenShift, you can associate the, the, the private hosted, hosted zone to the the shared VPC and specify the son ID in the install config file. You can only use uh, the pre-existing hosted, hosted private, private son, sorry, when providing your own VPC. This is not for situations, for example, where the VPC and the subnets are created by the installer. Next slide, please. Use a pre-existing instance high roles on AWS. So we have announced the OpenShift installer to allow pre-existing IAM's instance role to be passed in, to be passed it instead of the installer creating uh, those uh, BI, PI deployment, me deployment method. While, while the, the documented list of permissions remain exactly the same as previously, this allows the admins to, pro to provide additional permissions boundaries or use specific uh, name conventions for the bootstrap, uh, control plane, and worker instance roles. This is configured via the compute.platform.aws uh, uh, IAM role and the control plane platform AWS IAM role fields in the install config file. And just one note that the bootstrap instance shares the control plane IAM role. And next slides, uh, over Maria, please. Thank you so much, Mac, Marcos. Um, our customers want to use um, temporary short credentials during and post installation. We have started this work with the AWS provider because STS enables the authentication flow that allows a client to assume a role resulting in a short-lived credential. AWS extended their SDK to offer the web identity token now, and it allows the automation of the process of requesting and refreshing credentials using an open IED connect or identity access management identity provider. And OpenShift can sign a service account tokens trusted by AWS uh, IAM. These tokens can be then projected into a pod, and then the pod can use that for authentication. This feature became available in 4.7, but we are announcing the GA in 4.8, given um, everything that we've added for it. Um, in 4.8, we support new deployments, as well as uh, some greenfield field cases. Later in 4.9, we plan to continue to expand and improve the upgrade path, as well as automating some checks necessary to move forward. And we're also looking at other providers, but um, that's what we can offer for now. And now I'll pass it to Tushar. Next slide. Thank you, Maria. Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who are uh, 
familiar with OpenShift 4, uh, Red Hat has the hosted update service, uh, wherein this allows you to go to OpenShift cluster and see what are all the upgrade edges that are available, and then you can take uh, further action based on that. But unfortunately, this was not available for many of our users and customers who operate in uh, air gap, disconnected kind of environments, uh, which they have to do uh, because of various reasons, including uh, you know uh, their particular circumstances or policies. Uh, so here with the OpenShift update service, we're happy to announce the release of the on-premise version of this uh, a hosted update service, which we are calling the OpenShift update service. Uh, it is available as an operator, uh, no surprise there, uh, via the operator hub, uh, which allows users to post the update graph information for clusters residing in that restricted network. The service is comprised of two services. Uh, one is the graph builder, uh, which fetches the release payload information, OpenShift release payload information from a local container image registry, that which is what you have used to mirror uh, the content and builds an upgrade graph based on valid edges. Uh, the second one is the policy engine that can be then be responsible for selectively serving updates to the cluster uh, based on a set of filters that you define as admins. Um, so I hope you get to use this and we welcome some feedback on this for sure. Uh, next slide, please. I'm handing it over to Ramon. Thanks, Tushar. So let's talk now about uh, bare metal and, and the API workflow specifically. And uh, starting by one of our first uh, in 4.8 is the uh, option to run uh, or to boot nodes uh, using UEFI secure boot. Um, in, in this release, what we are doing is, um, well, the, the use case you know, right? Uh, you have a, a number of uh, nodes that you want uh, to protect against malicious code being loaded and executed in the boot process, right? So this is essentially UEFI Secure Boot. And in this release, we are uh, adding the ability to tell the installer directly which nodes you want to have enabled with UEFI Secure Boot. It's as easy as going to the install config.yaml file and go to the nodes that you want a UEFI Secure Boot and say that this is your boot mode. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and another addition that uh, we have in 4.8 is the ability to schedule parts based on bare metal hardware attributes and specific hardware attributes that uh, we've been learning, especially from uh, the telco uh, industry and with the help of the telco team, we've been learning about a number of attributes that are uh, related to um, a type of hardware that you may need, for example, to run pods uh, with maximum performance or with real time, right? And not all of your hardware, not, not all your nodes uh, will have this. Uh, attributes enabled, right? So you want to know when you schedule a node whether uh, you can place that pod in a node or not based on, on, on this hardware attribute. So the first thing you do is uh, you use the node feature discovery uh, operator. This is nothing new. And we have been adding, um, well, um, hardware attributes like, for example, checking if PS state is active or not. Uh, this is something we've learned that uh, customers it comes from telco uh, requirements, but in reality, any customer may want to know if a specific node supports a specific type of hardware accelerator or kernel state, etc. So in this example, you can see how you can tell um, a part to schedule, to be scheduled only via the node selector to nodes that have the CPU PS state active. Um, yeah, and next slide. Okay, and to finish with uh, new features in, in uh, bare metal, uh, one of the things that we've done is, um, so say that you have deployed a cluster with uh, virtual media, right, or with the assisted installer. To do this, you don't need a provisioning network, right? When you install through virtual media, all you need to do or all the installer does is map an image uh, to the BIOS over the network, obviously, but to the BIOS of the nodes, and then the nodes will boot that image as if it was locally, right? If you install uh, your nodes with the assisted installer, similarly, you're going to have an ISO. You will boot your nodes from that ISO, and you don't need a provisioning network. 
But say that uh, after your cluster is installed, now you have new nodes that you need to add via Pixie booting, right? You, you need to provision them uh, through Pixie booting. And for this, you do need a provisioning network. So in this release, we have added the ability to enable the provisioning network on day two, after the cluster has been installed and after uh, you start having this need, uh, wanting to have uh, your nodes deployed via Pixie, now you can do this uh, directly on existing nodes and the bare um, metal operator uh, allows you to do this now. And with this, uh, I finish with bare uh, metal and I'll hand it off to Moran to talk about zero touch provisioning. Hi everyone. Uh, so zero touch provisioning, what is it? Uh, it's aimed at regional distributed on-prem deployment, multi-cluster deployment, and it's enabling customers automated paths from zero, meaning uninstalled infrastructure, to a fully functional cluster with application running on it. The high level flow, as you can see on the right side, is basically begins with a site plan. So all the site infrastructure configuration and application data is fed into a Git repo, manifested into Git. Uh, using some of the uh, capabilities discussed before with GitOps integration with Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management, we can basically do the entire site planning and that's just waiting for something to happen. So that basically enables an unskilled technician to go to a remote site and using a barcode scan or some triggering of the GitOps, a change in Git, actually start the entire flow, start the entire provisioning of the cluster. So it's the provisioning, it's the configuration and application rollout. How do we do that? So basically this ZTP flow enablement integrates and leverage existing technology stack, uh, taking components like RHCM, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management, Hive, Metal3, Assistant Install, and leverage and integrate them together to provide an end-to-end -end flow for zero-touch provisioning. It has minimal prerequisites uh, and enabling untrained technician to do the physical installation while controlling the actual installing remotely. It can be done over layer three. It doesn't need any uh, additional services, external services or bootstrap node or anything like, like that. So it's very much ad focused. It is highly customable uh, deployment. It fits connected or disconnected IPv4, IPv6, DHCP, static IP, UPI, IPI, basically covers an entire uh, scope of bare metal deployment. It GitOps enabled, as I mentioned. Um, so this way we can, we can provide this experience. And next slide, please. So just uh, talking again about the ingredients and the logical phases we go through with this installation. So first of all, the site planning. The site planning is done and all the uh, data manifested in Git. It, we do the infrastructure as code. So infrastructure is one, is the first segment that we uh, added as Git and uh, as Git code and possible basically to, to deploy and uh, configure the entire uh, cluster. So it begins with the cluster provisioning, it moves and using RHCM policies and Argo CD integration to enforce policy and configuration on the cluster, and then uses additional mechanism with RHCM, which is called EPSAPS, to provide the application deployment and rollout uh, for, the for the application and workloads on the cluster. And with that, uh, Anand, would you like to share with us some control plane updates? Sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Anand. So let's talk about the control plane updates uh, in OpenShift for eight for the next couple of minutes or so. Thank you. The first one being a single service serving certificate for headless stateful sets. So this feature provides for automatic certificate generation and rotation for direct pot to pot communication similar to the service serving certificates operator. This lets you generate a service serving certificate for headless services now. Uh, and this includes a wildcard subject in the format of star.servicename.servicenamespace.svc. And this allows for TLS protected connections to individual stateful set pods without having to manually generate certificates for these pods. The only important thing to notice because the generated certificates contain wildcard certs for headless services, 
do not use the service CA if your client must differentiate between the individual pods. And if your client must differentiate between the individual pods, uh, uh, you know, generate individual DLS search by using a different service CA. The next feature is supporting subject claim URI scheme of the Open ID Connect IDPs. The problem being users of OIDC systems were, you know, formerly uh, unable to log into OpenShift in the cases where OIDC IDPs use subject claims adhering to the URI scheme. Why is this important? Because the OAuth server rejected logins from users of OIDC IDPs that are quite popular, like Microsoft or, uh, uh, you know, Yahoo or Google or Okta even though these followed the RFC requirements for the subject claim. And the OAuth server found this problematic and it rejected those subject claims. So in 4.8, users of IDPs that use the URI scheme um, in the subject claims will now be able to log into OpenShift. Next slide, please. So uh, the next feature in the control plane that uh, we're proud to talk about is improved customization of the audit config. Just to give you some context and to set some background, in 4.6, we introduced a node audit log policy feature that lets you control the information, the amount of information that's logged into the node audit logs. Uh, it had basically three profiles, default, write request, and all request. The default lets you log uh, only metadata for read and write requests. The write requests let you log uh, request bodies for every write request besides the metadata. And the all request bodies lets you uh, log request bodies for every read and write besides all the metadata, right? Uh, with 4.8, what we've introduced is in the default profile that you see on the top, you can now log request bodies for OAuth access token creation for both uh, creation and deletion, which is basically login and logout. And the way you would set this audit profile is you would uh, edit your API server resource object. Uh, and then edit the spec.audit.profile and you would set the specific profile you want, default or write request or all request. And then, you know, roll all the Kubernetes uh, 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 Cube API server pods. Make sure that all the nodes come up are on the latest revision and you're good to go. Next slide, please. So the next feature in the control plane that uh, we're proud to talk about is We've introduced two new alerts that get fired when uh, an API that will be removed in the next release is in use. Those two specific alerts are API removed and next release in use and API removed and next EU's release in use. So for instance, if you're using an API that's gonna be removed in the next uh, release or the next EU's release, we will you know, send you an alert that gets fired so you can be aware that you're using APIs that are soon gonna be deprecated. There is also another API we introduced called the API request count to track two things. One is the number of you know, API requests for every API, and also if you're using a deprecated API or not. So you could get this information two ways. You can obviously go to the OpenShift console, you know, go to the API Explorer, you know, look for the API request count object. Under that, you can see all the instances, and for each instance, you can see the number of requests, number of requests in the last 24 hours, so on and so forth. Or you can come to OC, uh, command line and say OC get API request count and that will list all the APIs, the usage for those APIs in terms of the request in the last hour, in the last 24 hours, but also there is another column called removed in the next release, right? So for instance, if you're using an API, for instance, ingress.v1 beta 1 dot extensions, it'll clearly tell you that it's been removed in the next, you know, cube 1.22 release. With that, I'll hand it to Duncan for the next section. Thanks, Anand. Um, so let's talk about cluster infrastructure. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on the internals, but that's not to say we haven't got some juicy additions for you. Um, you can see them on the slide. First up is user-defined tags for AWS. For those of you not familiar with it, you can af essentially assign metadata to your AWS resources. Um, each tag's really just a simple label consisting of a uh, Customer defined key and an optional value, and that just makes it easier to manage, search for, built on resources by power or owner or environment or other criteria. Um, next up, Azure Disk Encryption Sets, which unsurprisingly helps protect and safeguard your data. Um, this is about kind of meeting requirements um, from your security and compliance teams. It actually uses DM Crypt feature of Linux to 
provide the volume encryption, um, and there is some integration with Azure Kia Vault um, to help you control and manage your disk encryption keys on that side. And then finally, uh, we're bringing vSphere up to date with our other cloud providers and giving you auto scaling from zero. Um, again, those of you not familiar with, with this, it was all about, um, this is all about saving resources. Previously, to use auto scaling on vSphere, you had to have at least one node hanging around, even if it wasn't being particularly used, so we've done away with that requirement now. And with that, I'll say next slide and move us on to some network joy with Mark, I think. That's correct. Thank you, Duncan. So um, there were many new features and enhancements to OpenShift Networking in 4.8. Um, so I'll be covering some of them here in the next couple of slides as a uh, representative cross-section, roughly divided into ingress, egress enhancements, and then just sort of general networking enhancements. So on this slide, um, one of the big new things, HAProxy upgraded to 2.2 LTS. And so we get all the new features that are that are detailed in the link on this slide, um, including some of the major ones listed here in the bullets, uh, performance, security hardening, all the bug fixes, health checks, some improved observability, um, all things that are very important to us and our customers. Um, another thing, along with the HA proxy upgrade, we added several new supported customizations for it. So, for example, uh, this router use proxy protocol, this, this basically allows the source IP address to pass through a load balancer if that load balancer supports the protocol, like, like Amazon ZLB does. Um, there's also the router backend process endpoints. Um, so this is critical for shuffling endpoints for proper distribution of requests when you're running multiple routers that have a load balancer in front of them, like, uh, for example, an F5. Uh, the tunables there, the tune max to tune buff side. So uh, some customers have um, the use case of very large header data on the order of 48K or more. So um, but if HA proxy's buffer for that header data is not large enough, it gets dropped. So um, what we are what we did is we added support for the configurability of those parameters. We don't limit what that value is that you can set it to. Just keep in mind that the larger the cluster, the more memory it's going to consume um, as you increase that configured value. Um, another thing, customizable number of router threads, NB threads. So we since 4.1, we've supported the NB threads parameter. But what we did was we defined a fixed value of four threads. So that was determined to be sort of a best practices value um, for um, most or many, but not all workloads that our customers ran. So customers with really large cluster nodes asked us to make that uh, configurable. So we have in 4.8. Um, another one, IP failover, keep live D support. The keep live D image has been there in the product for a while, um, since three. Um, but in OpenShift, what we did in 4.8 is we formalized support for the use of that image to provide HA in OpenShift. Um, and as part of that support, we also um, now document a um, best practices procedure for implementing. On the Gateway API front, OpenShift 4.8 will um, present a developer's preview of Gateway API, formerly known by the names of uh, Ingress v2 and Service API. But uh, Gateway API represents a unifying technology for ingress, and we're targeting integration of it with Contour as the primary ingress controller for traffic alongside um, our current HA proxy. This will represent um, an enhanced integration with Envoy deployments and OpenShift service mesh. The global access option for um, GCP's ingress internal LB, um, without that particular option, traffic originating between projects in a shared VPC network um, have to be in the same region as the load balancer that's being used. So what this does, this facilitates communication cross-region for um, shared VPC deployments. And finally, the last one, egress IP load balancing enhancement. So this is for OpenShift SDN, and this provides the ability to spread traffic across uh, cluster nodes. So what this does is instead of having a single IP tied to a single host, uh, where all traffic, no matter where you in the cluster, would go out to, to be assigned that IP address. It removed that single node choke point, and um, we're going to be adding this same enhancement to OVN networking in the in a future version. Next slide, please. So in the category of general networking enhancements, so we have a rather large effort underway for OpenShift um, observability. And in general, this first enhancement on this slide represents uh, enablement of networking flows tracking um, and monitoring for network analytics. So basically, we're adding a NetFlow SFlow IP, um, IP fix collector to Oven Kubernetes. Um, this would give us a supported way to monitor traffic in and out of the cluster. 
Um, and this will be really helpful for those customers that, um, and for us as well, to troubleshoot performance issues, to do capacity planning, uh, security audits, and so on. Um, also in 4.8, we added some key SRIOV capable NIC hardware support for our customers. Um, and so um, those key, key sets of hardware are listed there in bullets. Um, one thing to note um, in the next version, uh, 4.9, I know this, this is about 4.8, but in 4.9, we're moving to a model of whatever RHEL supports we support. So this is going to hopefully remove um, any necessary future work in, on this. So um, we've also enhanced the OpenShift um, SDN uh, to Oven Kubernetes ENI migration that we support. So if you wanted to go from OpenShift SDN to OVN, um, we support it for all of our currently supported platforms. We already support IPI deployments, but now what we added for eight is all UPI deployments as well. Um, we've uh, enhanced and strengthened the rollback capability. And um, uh, just for planning purposes, keep in mind that when, if you do switch from one CNI plugin to another, um, that a reboot's gonna re be required of all the nodes. Um, but uh, hopefully that's, that's not too shocking. Um, and, and then uh, audit logging. So uh, for security and compliance reasons, our customers asked us to provide a mechanism to optionally audit logging of network policy events like accepts and denies. So that information is presented to the built-in logging stack and um, some custom Kibana dashboards. Um, and people uh, find this very useful for IDS or, or, or post-mortem post -mortem analysis. Um, and finally, Core DNS, we upgraded that as well to uh, version 1.8. And uh, this is going to include uh, a number of feature enhancements and bug fixes. Um, and with 1.8, we also provide the ability to control OpenShift, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, the DNS uh, pods placement within the cluster. And so this is for uh, customers with extreme workloads, and they want to be able to control where exactly that DNS is running within the cluster so that they can ensure that it gets proper um, resources to, to handle the DNS lookups um, and they're not overloaded by the rest of the workload. All right, uh, with that, next slide, please. Hi there, uh, my name is Robert Love. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, a feature that we're adding in 4.8 that allows NIC sharing and guaranteed bandwidth uh, for each of the entities using that, that NIC port. Um, so uh, some servers have a limited number of NICs uh, or they're lim they limit the number of NICs on purpose to minimize the number of cables that they have to pay for and manage. Um, so, you know, if you have a single NIC port and, and you want to share that between the control plane and the workloads, uh, we've added that functionality in 4.8. Uh, so via configuration on the Oven Kubernetes uh, SDN and um, configuration of NIC rate limiting, uh, we will allow that sharing of a single port between the control plane and the workloads. Um, so for example, if you have a, a 25 gig NIC and you wanna allocate 20 gigs to the workloads and five gigs to the control plane, uh, we allow you to do that and we will enforce the, the throughput limitations that are configured. Next slide, please. Uh, so a few releases ago, we introduced a operator called the Performance Add-on Operator. Uh, this is an operator that configures a lot of complexities um, on the node. Uh, this is particularly important for uh, Far Edge and Telco Far Edge. Uh, you really need to tune the node uh, uh, such that it's an appliance. You may need to specify the new topology, uh, the CPU layout, isolated CPUs that will be pinned to workloads. Uh, huge pages and, and other uh, node level configurations. Um, that performance add-on operator requires you to specify a performance profile. And what we're providing in 4.8 is a performance profile creator. So this is a tool that uh, introspects the hardware uh, and then generates the performance profile for the operator as a convenience uh, in creating this performance profile that can sometimes be quite complex. With that, I'll hand it over to Peter and the next slide. Thanks, Robert. I want to talk a little bit about OpenShift virtualization, which is the ability to run VMs inside of OpenShift. We've actually been generally available for over a year now since OpenShift 4.5. I want to talk about a couple of highlights here, uh, storage enhancements where you can have golden images in a particular namespace that are created by an administrator. 
and then instantly clone to other projects within your OpenShift cluster. The other thing is sometimes it can be a little tricky to get CSI compliance storage providers uh, working easily with VMs and Kubernetes. So what we've done is created this idea of a storage profile that automatically picks the proper access mode and storage type for virtual machines as you create them. The other thing I want to highlight is the ability to do compute intensive workloads such as AIML that may still be running in some VM pipelines and video rendering can actually use GPUs attached directly to the virtual machines to accelerate those workloads. You can hear more about uh, in recorded summit sessions where folks like Lockheed Martin have done some very clever things scaling their uh, infrastructure using virtual machines, pipelines, and GitOps functionality. And then there was also a dump the expert session uh, that we recorded as well. Now I'm going to turn it over to Miguel, who's going to talk about how to get your virtual machines into OpenShift. Thanks a lot, Peter. So as Peter said, I mean, we can run virtual machines in OpenShift, but how do we bring those virtual machines that we have currently running into OpenShift? Well, you have the migration with the migration toolkit for virtualization, now fully GA, fully generally available, and, uh, and you can use it uh, just to bring those VMs into OpenShift. So it uh, has an easy to use UI. You can use it also via the API in case you want to automate it. You can mass migrate uh, VMs from VMware to OpenShift. Um, we will add more sources to the migration. Uh, we have other feature that is war migration because we know that normally you require a, an intervention window to, to do those migrations. And war migration, what it does, it copies the data from the VM while it's running and then you shut down and you copy only the changes to it. Um, there's a validation service, a stack preview, that will review the VMs and the configurations that they have, like let's say raw device mappings, shared disks, CPU pinnings, and this kind of configuration that will require some manual intervention or that could render the migration not possible under the current circumstances. And uh, it will help you avoid having issues during the migration and it will, you will be able to review it before doing that. Of course, we are very focused on performance. So we have made a, uh, uh, we have added a feature that is being able to parallelize the VM conversion to maximize the throughput. And of course, in order to not impact other workloads that may be running, you will be able to select the migration network and redirect all that throughput to the network that is not going to impact other workloads. With this, I'll pass it to Erwin and thanks. Uh, I'll cover for everyone. Thanks, um, uh, Miguel. Um, hi, everyone. Again, um, the NVIDIA, I mean, uh, GPUs have been supported on OpenShift for quite some time now, but many of you have said, hey, how can we share those GPUs? The typical use case here really is uh, I have a bunch of data scientists. I have less number of GPUs than data scientists, and they want to use it for some development and experimental purposes. Maybe not necessarily full model training, but but uh, just to do some uh, development work, and they need access to a GPU so that they can, um, you know, uh, experiment with CUDA or some of the other uh, things that are possible on GPUs. So uh, NVIDIA introduced this idea of multi-instance GPUs or MEG uh, in uh, uh, earlier this year, maybe last year. Anyways, uh, and the GPU operator from NVIDIA uh, that is certified with OpenShift. Uh, did not have support for this so far, but with 1.7, that changes that. As you can see, with the 1.7 works on 4.6, 4.7, and 4.8 versions of OCP, and that allows for this MIG mode, allowing you for uh, sharing of GPUs. Uh, this is the native sharing uh, versus the uh, other ways in which you can do it, which is uh, the vGPU, uh, which we talked about at the last watch new. Uh, but this is an additional way. This is natively the A100 uh, and the A30 NVIDIA GPUs can be put in MIG mode, and the GPU operator can be useful for that. Uh, with that, that, that's it on this slide. Uh, you know, I, I'll hand it over to uh, Daniel for covering quick. Thank you, Tushar. So Red Hat Quay is our uh, central um, scalable registry platform uh, for a multi-cluster world. And because of that, we actually put it into the OpenShift Platform Plus 
bundle. And in there, it is usually installed via the operator on top of a OpenShift cluster, which we call the hub cluster or the service cluster, serving all the production clusters uh, uh, in this spoke. So for customers, in which case this cluster is in a disconnected environment, you usually have to overcome a catch-22 situation because in order to get to that cluster, you need to install it first, and for that, you need a registry. So to help customers who at that point don't already have a registry, we are going to deliver a streamlined, simplified Quay all-in-one installer um, that ships actually as part of OpenShift and uh, will deploy a lightweight, streamlined Quay instance on the same node from which you usually run OpenShift install. Uh, it will have uh, reduced requirements. Specifically, it does not require object storage, and it will live for the sole purpose of storing OpenShift core images and related operator images. Um, the mirroring itself will still be carried out via OC, and if that host that will run this all-in-one Quay uh, instance is actually behind a firewall or behind an air gap, there will also be an offline variant of that installer available. And since the scope of the support for this Quay instance is reduced to just OpenShift payload mirroring, um, it will actually be available to all OpenShift customers with a valid subscription at no additional cost. It's going to run on RHEL 8 using Podman, and uh, it will be released shortly after 4.8 goes GA, and you can retrieve it from cloud.redhat.com as a binary with the image or without the image from the same place from which you get uh, the OC binaries and OpenShift install. Next slide. Um, another feature um, that we are adding with Quay 3.6, which is going to uh, trail the OpenShift uh, 4.8 release slightly, is called nested repository support. And this is for all those customers who are using Quay as an ingress for multiple upstream registries and want to organize content in a single organization in Quay um, further. Um, so organizations in Quay are our highest level bucket and all the images live inside at least one organization. And it's usually like a flat namespace, right? So when you have a lot of images that you mirror down, for instance, as part of mirroring the OpenShift operator catalogs, this gets quite convoluted, right? And there's a potential for naming collisions as well. So nested repository support will support users using forward slashes and repository names, therefore creating the concept of subfolders, quote unquote, to structure the content in an organization. You see some examples of how this will look like on the left-hand side of this slide. And while some of these may actually be in the same folder or have the same uh, image name and tag, they will actually all be different images and they will not collide with each other. So this eases um, mirroring of OpenShift catalogs uh, with operators. This also eases mirroring with scope view with multiple upstream registries, uh, and it will all be able to live inside one organization, which is making permission management much easier. What you don't get as part of this is hierarchical permission management in those folders. So think of it as very similar to object storage buckets, where inside a bucket you can also have a folder, but you know all the access management, uh, the permissions, and the ACLs are still managed either at the bucket level or at the object level. And with that, I hand over to uh, our course, Mark. All right. Um, all right, thanks. In RHEL CoreOS 4.8, I want to highlight uh, two items. First is the based uh, on RHEL 8.4 binary content, and so all the latest goodness and hard enablement that that entails. Second, I'd like to bear attention to Butane, formerly known as FCC to the Fedora CoreOS config transpiler and available upstream. Uh, we found that FCCT didn't quite roll off the tongue, nor was it quite the right name, as the tool is not actually Fedora CoreOS specific. And so now it's called Butane, and we are shipping it with OpenShift. Uh, Butane is there to help you create ignition configs and now uh, machine configs more easily. Other features include, for example, easier inlining of configuration files and fragments. Rather than needing to base64 encode the file content, you can just add it directly to the Butane YAML file, like you see on the left. Um, and you can do that for normal files as well as systemd units. Uh, this makes configurations much easier to generate and far more readable. 
And new in 4.8, Butane allows you to slurp in a directory of files and create a machine configuration to push out the group to RHEL CoreOS hosts. Uh, it's much simpler than uh, trying to manage that before. And lastly, we've also consolidated the Lux disk, disk encryption and boot mirroring configuration workflows with document configurations, uh, Latin 4.8 documentation. And with that, I will hand the baton back to Duncan Hardy. Thanks, Mark. Um, I guess we're on to storage now. Um, and um, with OpenShift Storage, we continue our long and arduous journey to CSI. Um, the end's actually in sight. Um, many of the entry drivers already have their deprecation notices in place and are getting ready to be removed in a, front, a future upstream release. Um, and for us, the move to upstream is coming in two parts. Um, you've got migration and the drivers themselves, which in our case are provided with as operators. Um, starting off with the migration, um, that's the thing that gets you seamlessly from your entry driver over to your equivalent CSI one. Um, as you can see, we've got tech previews in place for OpenStack Cinder and AWS EBS. Um, unfortunately, this is a per driver effort, so we're just gonna have to keep um, going through and, and, and getting rain to getting them all moved across. On the operator side, we're Jing uh, GCE disks and bringing tech previews for Azure and vSphere. And what you'll see us trying to do here is we'll tech preview in, re in a release and then GA in, that, in the release afterwards. So you'll see this kind of rolling rollout, I guess. Um, you can see the table on the left-hand side to, to see how we're progressing at the moment. And please don't worry, all the support's still there for the entry drivers. This is just us getting ready for the switch over. Um, finally, um, on our side, there's a completion of the addition of AWS tags, complementing what we did on the cluster infrastructure side. Um, for those, those of you asleep or ignoring me earlier, these are the tags to help you manage, identify, organize, search for, and, and filter resources. Um, one little kind of tip there, um, don't put personally identified information in tags. That's just not what they're designed for. Next slide, please. Uh, and then we've got um, the OpenShift Data Foundation. So hopefully you've um, all caught the name change from OpenShift Container Storage. I, I'm still trying to get my brain used to talking about it. They've also been extremely busy um, with the release. You can see all the features uh, there on the slide, but let's touch on a few. Um, Metro DR Stretch, which is a stretch cluster with an arbitra arbitrator for two data centers is in there. Um, Multis for network, isolation between data and control traffic, and you can see PV granularity encryption with KMS integration. Um, this is an addition to the cluster-wide encryption that was already in, introduced in one of the previous releases. Um, two interesting dev preview features there in this release as well. The first is um, what we're calling regional disaster recovery. That's asynchronous replication across clusters deployed in multiple regions. And the second one is um, something called data segregation per host group. Um, this is for customers that need to isolate and bind tenant workloads and data to a specific set of hosts. Um, next slide, please. That moves us nicely onto um, multi-architecture. <clears throat> so on the IBM P and Z side, it, it does actually feel now like we've got all the main features and add-ons in place that we really need to push OpenShift into those markets. Um, that said, there's always more that we can do, more that we can add. Um, so in this release, you know, we've got a few things coming that we've already got on the x86 side, uh, the cluster log foldering, so you can take use of the log aggregate aggregators if you want to. Um, there's other things like the Converge 3 node cluster to allow you make more efficient use of, of your system. This is particularly important on the Z side where the IFLs are, are, are quite expensive. And then, you know, enabling that better security practices by encrypting your data store. There are a couple of things that only make sense for certain platforms. So on the Z side, um, we're filling out our portfolio of storage that we support with this 4K FCP disk support. Um, I remember the days when this first came along and we could only do NFS storage. So it's nice to see that story rounded off. And then on the power side, we've got a uh, multiple gain for SRIOV. I'm sure you all know this much better than I do already, but you know, SRIOV is about allowing a PCI device to appear as multiple separate physical devices. 
at the end of the day, this is just all about performance, and on these systems, performance is what it's all about, so bringing that to that platform is really good. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Jamie, and who will talk to us about, I think, some security goodness. Thanks, Duncan. So advanced cluster security is a holistic security solution designed specifically for Kubernetes. And we want to talk to you about how we're helping advance your security program. So over the last quarter, we've been hard at work. And we're pleased to announce that we've achieved the Red Hat Certified Technology Vulnerability Scanner designation. And what this designation does is it represents transparency and accuracy on the issues that matter most to containers with Red Hat packages. So it's going to help you reduce the cost of your vulnerability management program by helping you apply the appropriate context for software packages that are identified as vulnerable. So when this context is applied over a more generalized data source like the NVD, this can change a risk severity of an issue, help highlight potential risk compensating controls, and even establish when an issue is relevant. So by highlighting this relevancy, your teams avoid wasting time triaging an issue that doesn't apply to a Red Hat package. And this helps you focus on real threats for your clusters and reduce false positives so you can give back time to your development team in order to focus on delivering business value. And if your organization has risk tolerance policies, this influences them greatly. We're also working on improving the industry standard OpenShift security configurations for security and compliance. We help teams identify compliance configuration. We help them measure and report on compliance status across clusters and report on opportunities to improve security posture with our integration through the compliance operator. This will help add to our additional, our existing suite of compliance solutions and help showcase exactly for OpenShift what you need to do in order to achieve certified technology compliance standard. We're also working on aligning to with the OpenShift experience. If you're not familiar, advanced cluster security is part of an acquisition through StackRox, and we're hard at work in order to align with OpenShift. So what are we doing? We're accelerating the operationalization of security use cases with our oper new operator, and we're creating a consistent user interface and experience. So you'll see that the look and feel of our user interface has changed. We also deliver value very differently than the rest of OpenShift. So I want to call out that our release schedules are not in the standard OpenShift 4.8 timeframe. We work on three-week release cycles in order to accelerate the time to customer value. So what you'll see here is things like our, everything here on this slide is already delivered, but because we work on such tight release frames, you're going to see us be delivering feature value much faster, and you're going to see us being able to discuss with the market things that aren't ready yet. So for instance, our operator is being in, in active development right now and coming soon. So with that, be excited, and on to you, Jimmy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. Next slide, please. All right. So just wanted to uh, give everybody uh, a quick overview of what's going on with uh, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes. So Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes provides an end-to-end -end management visibility and control to manage your clusters and app life cycles, plus security and compliance of your entire Kubernetes domain across multiple data centers and public clouds. With this release, we focus a lot on the end user experience. We uh, are announcing that we have a wonderful UI refresh to keep it more in line with the OpenShift look and feel. We also have the ability to import and manage OpenShift on Amazon or Rosa. Um, a lot of our customers are now uh, migrating a lot of their workloads into that. So, of course, it makes sense to have a management tool to be able to help them go through that process. We also have the ability to run the ACM hub or uh, the main, basically, where ACM kind of runs um, in OpenShift and IBM Power. 
So this was a big ask from a lot of our IBM customers. We also can provision OCP within uh, Red Hat OpenStack. So uh, this was an ask from, um, you know, since the product was 1.0 days. Um, a lot of our customers are, are running OpenStack and they want to be able to run o, uh, OCP or OpenShift right on top of it, right? Having the ability to be able to provision that directly from ACM um, it, it's a huge uh, advantage as you can keep everything, all the management, all of your clusters consistent across the different platforms. We also have expanded a lot on the cluster lifecycle support and we have included, we have All right, looks like we might have lost uh, me there. Um, I'll take over. Um, hey. So, oh, yeah, Jimmy, hey, here you go. Rob, oh, this Scott, is Scott. Okay. I can jump in until Jimmy's audio comes back. So, Jimmy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in on the cluster pools and talk about the value that we're delivering base allows you to quickly deploy clusters, have those clusters be in a hybrid state so they're not consuming resources on the cloud or generating costs. These are great for development environments. These are also great for CI, CD in situations when you need to quickly spin up a cluster and then bring it back down in the pool. Also bring the worker pool scaling. So a lot of you have been asking to be able to scale up and down clusters centrally, and we can now do that uh, directly from the ACM user interface. Uh, I'm going to move through a couple of these quickly, but the cluster sets allows us the ability to do grouping of clusters for simplified RBAC experience. And that's also how we leverage UI support to configure Submariner. It's been a big ask that teams want to quickly make use of Submariner as a cross-networking component, but they don't really know how to do it. They don't really want to go through a bunch of steps. So we're accelerating the amount of time it takes to make use of Submariner for cross-cluster networking services. The discovery and import is awesome. It brings the, the reach of cloud.red hat into ACM. So bringing some of these services directly from the cloud and providing a way to discover your existing clusters and quickly import those into ACM and bring them. This is awesome. It really improves the time to value and getting your existing fleet under management with ACM. And then lastly, so many folks have been asking for the ability to update cluster versions, and we can do that in batch. We can take a selection of clusters and move their version channel to stable or, or candidate releases of the next major version and allow you to roll groups of clusters to those uh, new versions in a, in a bulk way. So really reducing the time it takes to manage your environment. Jimmy, do you want to check your audio and see if you're back? Yeah, I should be back. I apologize for that. I'm not sure, quite sure what happened there. No worries. We're ready for the next slide. Take it away. Yes, thank you so much, Scott. Appreciate you taking over there. All right. So going on to the next, um, you know, about expanding and portfolio and embracing open source. Um, we are happy to announce that Red Hat Advanced Cluster Manager for Kubernetes is now fully open source. Um, and you can see the URL there for if you wanted to go ahead and check out everything now from the cluster lifecycle to application to security and governance, everything within the product is now fully open source. So we're very happy to announce that. We're also happy to announce that um, the Red Hat Ansible integration uh, is now fully GA. So for those of you that uh, a little bit of history lesson, uh, for um, ACM 2.0, we introduced the ability to be able to have an integration with Ansible. Uh, and this uh, brought a lot of value to our customers. Uh, we were able to integrate from the application lifecycle perspective, being able to do pre and post tasks. Um, and this, again, brought a big value to our customers. Uh, we having the ability to quickly integrate with third party tools within their data center. So the buck, obviously, when you're building Kubernetes clusters, doesn't stop at just being able to, um, you know, provision clusters, right? There is a slew of things that happen behind the scenes before you get there. But now we're happy to announce that 
We also have expanded that integration besides making a GA. We now have the ability to have a cluster lifecycle integration. So you're able to integrate um, Ansible playbooks pre and post, um, you know, cluster deployment. We also have integration with the governance risk and security perspective. Um, so we're able to trigger remediations based on a specific policy violation. So um, if you wanted to take an action within your policy, uh, perhaps, um, you know, open up a, a, a ticket uh, or integrate with a ticketing system or perhaps perform a remedi remediation that requires an interaction with a third party system, you're able to do that. Uh, and we bring that power of uh, Ansible into ACM. We also, um, you know, as Simac mentioned earlier on the call, uh, it feels like it was an hour and a half ago, and it was, um, is uh, the full integration right now with Red Hat uh, OpenShift GitOps, um, or as we call it, Argo CD as well. So now you, within the application lifecycle, uh, if you, call, you, you have uh, Argo CD and you're using leveraging Argo CD, you're able to fully integrate within the ACM um, UI all of your applications and you're able to interact with the applications in a seamless way. So you're able to deploy the applications, interact with the applications, troubleshoot issues with the application. And this is a huge value add for customers that are running Argo CD um, as their application deployment engine today. Um, and that's really who, you know, we're basically targeting, you know, those customers that kind of have multiple Argo CDs, uh, deployments and they just want to bring it and, and centralize it into one uh, single place. So ACM really uh, enables you to do that. Uh, and of course, uh, we are constantly adding new policies, uh, new governance compliance policies. So I highly encourage you to go and uh, look at the GitHub repo. We're constantly updating those as well. Next slide, please. All right. From a multi-cluster observability perspective, um, we continuously keep uh, uh, enhancing the ability to have uh, visibility into your clusters. We understand that, um, you know, part of management of clusters is just not only provisioning them, right? We got to continue with the day two operations. And so part of the day two operation enhancements here is the integration with uh, insights. Uh, uh, so Red Hat Insights is um, you know, a tool that runs within the cloud.redhat.com construct, and it allows you to have that uh, deeper visibility into um, what's going on with your clusters, right, uh, from patches to errata information and much, much more. Um, so, you know, this runs as an operator now inside um, your um, ACM instance and is able to kind of uh, integrate with uh, insights from cloud.redhat.com, bringing all of those metrics right into the ACM UI. So there's no need for you to go and uh, log into uh, cloud.redhat.com to kind of see that that directly. We also have the ability to, um, uh, you know, have advanced configuration for long-term metrics. So obviously, you know, as your deployments grow, uh, you will have more and more metrics, right, that you kind of want to be able to kind of keep track of uh, to make sure that you're able to kind of establish patterns and see, you know, uh, as as you go through uh, and the analysis, right, of your clusters, right, you want to make sure that you can establish patterns. So now we have the ability to configure those as well. Uh, we also have the ability to uh, configure alert forwarding from from uh, all of your managed clusters directly into the ACM hub, and this this makes it easier for being able to create alerting. Uh, so you can create alerting and integrate alerting to things like Slack, for example, um, and you can kind of see here a screenshot of you know of, of an alert that on a Slack alert. They, that provides you a direct link into a Grafana dashboard to be able to kind of go deeper in, and uh, analyze more of that, what's going on there. We also have available, uh, uh, we can customize uh, uh, specific metrics, right? You have uh, able to uh, kind of have those recording uh, rules to support those as well. Um, so with this release, really, as I mentioned, we 100% focusing on uh, end user experience, the ability to bring more visibility into 
your clusters, the ability to uh, make it easier to provision clusters um, um, at a larger scale and deploy applications much, much easier and integrate with other tools within the portfolio of Red Hat. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to Sergio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jimmy. Next slide, please. So in cost management, we've been working in a few things. So the first thing we notice is that the navigation has changed. Um, right now, we are now under the OpenShift clusters um, navigation. So it's just slightly different how you're going to get there. And meanwhile, we've been working on adding Google Cloud support, uh, but only for infrastructure. This, we are still working in OCP and GCP. There's some changes that we need to do to fully support it, but it's actually been developed. Uh, right now, you can add your GCP sources and have the same breadth of functionality you have in Amazon and in Azure today. And talking about Amazon, uh, we also lift the requirement to add a parent account. So if you have any child account that generates its own core files, you will be able to add it. And that's it's going to simplify adding Amazon sources when you are not um, responsible for the parent account or your cluster or you just want to uh, add only a piece of your infrastructure into cost management. All that information also, we've worked to create the new Cost Explorer, that it's a, a fully time series view of your data. You can group, you can filter by different concepts. You can see that in time, and in fact, is the, is the core of new developments in the future where we will be allowing more than 60 days of data. And also it's important to notice that it's the first view where you can see the line items numbers. So you can see like a table, all the information in the graphics below the table, and you can of course download it. So it's a very good way of looking at the information and, and have new insights into your data. Next slide, please. More important things, um, we now have a certified operator. It's we're going to keep the COCO, the open source version of the operator for beta testing and for advanced development. But now it's possible to use the certified operator. And in fact, it's so easy that you can actually install both operator in parallel. If you want to test the new one while you are installing the certified, it's perfectly fine. Uh, right now, installation is still support on our gap, and it's less than a minute if you use the standard installation. We're working a lot in performance. You will see that the, the time we take to up, update the data and the performance of the tool overall has improved a lot. And also one thing that we like a lot is that right now when you look in, uh, into OpenShift Cluster Manager, you will have a, a widget showing you the cost of your cluster. So this is the first uh, integration between the overall OCM and cost management. We plan to continue adding new features so you can have more views of your cost. Um, that's all for cost management. Um, so I'm going to give the, to Christian Heidelreich so that he can talk about our survivability. Thank you, Sergio. Um, really excited to basically present the last two slides of today's session. Um, first, we are kicking off uh, with another round of improvements for our native observability experience. So you all know since uh, a long time we've been craving to give you better tools inside the OpenShift console so that you don't have to leave um, the the very warm kind of experience that you have in the console go to a third-party system. Um, in 4.4, we uh, reached a milestone by adding uh, important dashboards um, into the console itself, and we've been since then improving that. Um, 4.8. It's just another round to just make it easier to work with the dashboards that we have. So we have tons of new features coming in. Um, just as just two examples, uh, one is instead of just selecting like seconds, minutes, hours, um, you're now able to basically select a very specific time range that you want to look into um, for your dashboards. Um, we have groups now. Um, so if you have a very big dashboards with many, many different shards, we are now grouping similar shards into into very specific groups so that you can easily uh, digest the data that you can actually see. And then we 
have uh, a few others um, like zooming. So if you zoom basically into one dashboard, every dashboard is getting updated as well. And then if you, you can also then now click kind of like into a specific shard, you go to um, our metrics explorer and you can you know, further explore and nail uh, or drill down into into very specific things um, as well. Um, it's very nice, very uh, good new enhancement, and we will continue to obviously provide best possible experience um, that we can. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, switching gears a little bit to logging now. Um, JSON has been probably the most requested feature for us for a long time. Um, we had some issues in the past on how we basically provided um, JSON capabilities to our customers, and um, we've put in tons of work to uh, basically, you know, work around those limitations that we have. Provide something that we can uh, fairly say that um, you know we are. Um, we, we feel good with. Um, and um, the way how we basically expose uh, the JSON feature is um, through our log forwarding API. Um, so we wanted to make sure we actually support two different type of use cases. One is um, you are a customer who uh, uses primarily third party systems. And the only thing you want to do is you want to be able to deploy a collector uh, make sure you select the logs that you are interested in, pass those logs into adjacent objects, and send those off into your third-party system. Um, that is what we basically do now with the cluster log forwarding API. That's uh, basically use case one. The second use case is, um, you know, you are a customer that is using our managed Elasticsearch, and um, you want to, um, you know, put in, um, specific logs into our managed Elasticsearch and also JSON objects so that you can go to Kibana and then uh, query uh, individual fields um, to really selectively choose what kind of logs you are interested in. Um, that is also available through um, the log forwarding API. So everything that you really do, our prim your primarily interface basically set everything up is the cluster log forwarder CR that we have. Um, and there you basically just uh, put in what you need, um, put in like what kind of uh, logs you need to pass, and then you tell us what uh, schemas those um, logs um, primarily um, relate to. Um, so you might have like a WebLogic application, JBoss application or whatever that all use the same schema, right? This is very important for some of the uh, more advanced uh, log management system to know what kind of schema so that they can kind of like group those logs into into a single entity um, to save operational costs, to save kind of like, you know, how things are going and to give you kind of like a more reliable approach. And um, last but not least, last one that we have here is, um, I talked a little bit, little bit about the selectiveness, the flexibility. Um, in four, in, in five point one, so the upcoming logging solution, what we also do expose now is um, the ability for you to select specific logs based on pod labels. Um, so before you had the ability to um, push logs from specific uh, namespaces or projects into your third party application, um, now you're basically able to choose uh, from specific pod labels. So you can you might have like specific apps that need to go into a specific um, uh, into a specific topic into Kafka uh, as an example. Um, you might have uh, team labels on specific pods. You are not using namespace as a team. You're basically using labels to identify what kind of uh, application belong to what kind of team. So they can do that as well now. Um, so we are pretty excited um, for the next round. Um, of logging features and um, that's it for today. Um, hope you all enjoyed the session and um, I think Rob, you probably want to, to say something in the end, right? Yeah, I'm just gonna say thanks for joining. Um, we got a bunch of great stuff coming out in OpenShift 4.8, so look for that um, on your clusters and your upgrades uh, here in a few weeks. Um, and a reminder, so this is all about 4.8. We also have another session coming up in about a month on kind of looking ahead for what's next in OpenShift, so we would love you to join us for that too. Thank you all so much.